Well, hi, everybody, and welcome to Tea with Jesus for this week. Now, this week, we're going to be doing the second half of what I had recorded last week. We're going to be really going now into 1 Corinthians 7, 6 through 11. So if you'd like to join with me now, we'll go back into the study. I'd like to go on now and um, read again verses 6 through 9. I say this as a concession, not, a, not as a command. But I wish everyone were single, just as I am. Yet each person has a special gift from God of one kind or another. So I say to those who aren't married and to widows, it's better to stay unmarried, just as I am. But if they can't control themselves, they should go ahead and marry. It's better to marry than to burn with lust. Um, he knows that, that desires are, are a, a, a part of life. And even though Paul has chosen to stay single and he feels like it's kept his life more simple, um, he also knows that... I think most of the time people really need to be in a healthy relationship like that. I'm going to go ahead and look at 1 Corinthians 9, 1 through 6. This is really cool. Paul himself had decided to be single, but listen to this. He's, he's addressing the fact that he's been getting a lot of criticism. And um, I just think it's, it's pretty cool what he says here. Let's just go ahead in chapter 9 here and read these first six verses. Am I not as free as anyone else? Am I not an apostle? apostle? Haven't I seen Jesus our Lord with my own eyes? Isn't it because of my work that you belong to the Lord? Even if others think I'm not an apostle, well, I certainly am to you. You yourselves are proof that I am the Lord's apostle. This is my answer to those who question my authority. Don't we have the right to live in your homes and share your meals? Now listen to what he says here. Don't we have the right to bring a Christian wife with us as the other apostles and the Lord's brothers do and as Peter does? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have to work to support ourselves? And what's cool there is that, you know, Paul is basically saying that, um, you know, he has been an apostle to them, even if people are criticizing that and saying he's not. You know, he has shared the Lord with them. He has a right to come and share in their homes. And if, if he wasn't single... He would have the right to, to stay with him and to um, bring his, his Christian wife along as the other apostles and the Lord's brothers do and as Peter does. So that is so cool to me because apparently some of the others, their wives traveled right along with them. And I just thought that was really, really cool. And so Paul is not just criticizing marriage, but he is he's a strong person and he's opinionated and he admits it when sometimes it's his own opinion and not necessarily a direct command of the Lord. But he has just found his life to be simpler, staying single. But people should go ahead and marry, <laughs> you know. And uh, so I just think it's kind of cool um, how that he interacted with many other followers of Christ who had their wives with them. Um, and he had just, you know, chosen to stay single. In chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, he did say in here that God has gifts, a special gift of one kind or another for everyone. I just want to read in 1 Corinthians 12 and just read, read verse 11 in light of that. It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. So there are gifts that God has given us. We'll be learning more about these as we go along. But, you know, he said here, every person has a special gift from God of one kind or another. <laughs> Paul does talk in here about how that if widows um, are struggling, um, or if someone who's not married is struggling, then they probably should marry. He goes on later in this, in this book, on um, this letter, to talk about that young widows who, um, you know, could go on and, and marry again and stuff, um, probably should and that it's only like the older ones or those that are not able to take care of themselves who should be having the church just really support them. But that's something that Paul gets into more later. Okay, now let's look at verses 10 and 11. But for those who are married, I have a command that comes not from me. Remember earlier he said that this is just something that, that um, it's not a command, it's just a concession he'd like to make. <laughs> But now, he says, but for those who are married, I have a command that comes not from me, but from the Lord. 
A wife must not leave her husband, but if she does leave him, let her remain single or else be reconciled to him, and the husband must not leave his wife. All right, let's look at some different things that have been said about this um, and some things that Jesus said. God really established marriage, and it is something that he really supports and um, wants to be strong. Um, what, what he joined together, he does not want man to tear apart. You know, we hear that in the marriage um, ceremony all the, all the time. Let not man put this asunder. So um, the marriage covenant is a covenant and it's sacred. And so I want to read a, a scripture in Malachi. Malachi, that's the last Old Testament book. It's in Malachi 2, 13 through 17. And I've read Malachi before, but this time when I read it, this just really hit me in terms of marriage and how the Lord feels about marriage. It's something that he created way back in the Garden of Eden. I'm starting in verse 13. Here's another thing you do. You cover the Lord's altar with tears, weeping and groaning, because he pays no attention to your offerings and doesn't accept them with pleasure. You cry out, why doesn't the Lord accept my worship? I'll tell you why. Because the Lord witnessed the vows you and your wife made when you were young, but you have been unfaithful to her. Though she remained your faithful partner, the wife of your marriage vows. Didn't the Lord make you one with your wife? In body and spirit, you are his. And what does he want? Godly children from your union. So guard your heart. Remain loyal to the wife of your youth, for I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. To divorce your wife is to overwhelm her with cruelty, says the Lord of heaven's armies. So guard your heart. Do not be unfaithful to your wife. You have wearied the Lord with your words. How have we wearied him, you ask? You have wearied him by saying that all who do evil are good in God's sight, and he's pleased with them. You have wearied him by asking, where's the God of justice? So here, here is someone that's being spoken of. It's like, God, why aren't you accepting my offerings? Why aren't you listening to my prayers? And God said, you have been unfaithful. You've been unfaithful to your vows. You have been unfaithful to your wife. And that divorce overwhelms her with cruelty. And remember back in, in Peter, we were just reading that a husband does not want to have his prayers hindered by how he treats his wife. Um, I, God takes this really seriously. Now, I want to say here, I am not saying that anybody should stay in a marriage relationship where they are being physically abused or treated with extreme cruelty. Um, sometimes you just have to get away from a situation. You know, that can go both ways. Um, a husband can be mistreated badly by his wife or a wife by her husband. You need to get out of the situation. You need to get children out of the situation. That doesn't mean an immediate divorce, but there has to be kind of a, you know, getting out of the damage. Of course. I mean, that, that you know, God does not want someone to stay in a situation where they are being injured and hurt. And... Jesus did establish one thing that he says would be a grounds. And let's go ahead and go to Matthew 5, 31 and 32. This is Jesus speaking. You have heard the law that says a man can divorce his wife by merely giving her a written notice of divorce. Whew. But I say that, the ma that a man who divorces his wife, unless she has been unfaithful, causes her to commit adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman also commits adultery. So there is a, one thing there that Jesus mentioned, and that is adultery. Um, I want to go to Matthew 19, 9. Now, uh, once again, he's had people asking him about the, this law that says a man can give his wife a written notice of divorce and send her away. Jesus replied, Moses permitted divorce only as a concession to your hard hearts, but it was not what God had originally intended. And I tell you this, whoever divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery, unless his wife has been unfaithful. 
And of course that goes both ways. If a husband's been unfaithful or if a wife has been unfaithful. I want to also look here at Mark 10, 6 through 12. And this is Jesus saying this. <laughs> I don't care what the world tries to say. This is the words of Jesus. But God made them male and female from the beginning of creation. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Since they are no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. Later, when he was alone with his disciples in the house, they brought, the they brought up the subject again. He told them, whoever divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries someone else, she commits adultery. Okay, now we've got to put all of that together um, in terms of what Jesus said. Now you notice that in this last scripture, he was referring to husbands and wives in terms of uh, their own behavior. And basically from everything I can gather here, the one thing that can um, free someone for a marriage to be taken apart <laughs> Um, is adultery. Um, and if that has occurred, then the, the person can end up divorced. I don't think that's ex at all what God wants, but adultery in a marriage really causes terrible damage. And Jesus said, unless the person's been unfaithful, don't divorce them. Well, basically he's saying if the person has been unfaithful, then a divorce might be allowed. Um, but in any case, except for, a, uh, except for unfaithfulness, God does not want marriages to be broken apart. And um, if, if people just divorce and there's no adultery involved in that, and then they just go on, it, um, it can cause them to be in future adulterous relationships. And that's basically exactly how the Lord put it. But I think ultimately God's desire is that people be able to maintain this covenant of marriage and so I think an awful lot of it's going to depend on what happens with the person who has been unfaithful. I think that if there can be genuine repentance and a desire to be really, really open before God and humble before God, that a couple can work through to forgiveness and to reconciliation. It, it can happen, even if there has been unfaithfulness. And sometimes that can just show a wonderful, the wonderful power of God at work and people clean it, it can still end up with really strong relationships. But adultery cannot be taken lightly. And um, if someone is not at all repentant, and that just seems to be what they're going to continue to do, Jesus seems to be saying that that frees the other partner up. That is the one thing where divorce, divorce could be allowed. And so at the very end here of our passage, it says here that a wife should not leave her husband, but if she does, she should remain single or else be reconciled to him. With, with the one caveat that I just said about unfaithfulness, we have to put all of it together. But God would want, if all possible, for reconciliation to happen. And it says that the husband must not leave his wife. Believe me, it goes both ways. God's not just talking about women here. He's also talking about men. And I love the term of reconciliation. I think it's amazing. And that word reconciled that's used here in this verse 11 is atalasso. Atalasso. It actually starts with a K, but it's pronounced atalasso. And it's interesting. It means to change, to exchange, to reestablish, to restore relationships to make things right, to remove an enmity. There's five times when the word refers to God reconciling us to himself through the life, death, and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. That we have been reconciled to God through Jesus. Uh, look at Romans 5.10 or 2 Corinthians 5.18. Whether speaking of God and man, well, whether speaking of God and people or a husband and wife, Atalasso describes the reestablishing of a proper, loving, interpersonal relationship, restoring something which has been broken or disrupted. And it can be amazing what the power of God can really do, even in situations that can seem so broken. 
to truly understand forgiveness, wow, it is a, a strongly powerful thing and only God can really bring that about um, in our life. It took the blood of Jesus for us to be forgiven before God and, and in our own interpersonal relationships. Forgiveness can be really powerful. But God does take unfaithfulness very seriously and it does seem to be, when it comes right down to it, the one ground that someone can have. But I think God's desire is still to somehow see restoration. Because for one thing, the partner that's been unfaithful really needs to repent and with humility be restored back to where God wants that person to be. Because he wants, he wants the best for us, for us. So I want to just, just take a moment here. Um, Corinth was such a sinful society, especially in sexual matters. It was just a part of their culture. There were prostitutes in the, you know, in the, the temple there where they worshipped a goddess. It was in, just in, into their entire culture. And unfortunately, we in our world today, our culture is on an extremely slippery slope. And we have got to recognize the counterfeit. We have got to know the genuine things that God's wanted in our life as far as sexuality and how beautiful it is. And then be able to see how damaging and empty this counterfeit is that the enemy is trying to establish. Think about what's been happening. I say one of the first things that as far as just openly in society, divorce started to be taken a lot more lightly. Um, it just, if you just kind of got tired of each other or if you didn't feel like you were so much in love. So people were divorced, began to divorce more and more all the time. And not for, you know, um, abuse or cruelty or, or terrible in, in, in unfaithfulness, but just because people decided they outgrew each other. And it got more lightly all the time. Then it got to where prem premarital sex, which by the way is what fornication is, premarital sex um, has gone... Uh, along the way to where it became gradually accepted and now it is an expected norm. And it is expected for people to be involved sexually when they like somebody at a younger and younger age. It's like, well, isn't just that what, just what you do? It is an accepted norm. And then we started seeing the definition of marriage, the, the whole concept of marriage and that as the foundation of a family started becoming blurred and then obliterated. Now I'm not talking about a family that has to be a single parent and kids, or maybe a, a parent and some family members taking care of children. There's a lot of different ways that people um, can, can make a family if a husband, wife, kids relationship isn't possible. But that doesn't mean that we completely obliterate the definition of marriage. It has now gotten to where the whole idea of marriage is like being completely like like taken away and and family is supposed to be defined in so many different ways that I think even the concept of a family is starting to be more and more blurred and I'm afraid that is going to be obliterated also and then people are losing their sense of what it means to be a male or be a female ma a man or a woman masculine or feminine just losing the ability to really understand and be taught by, by adults that love them what it means to be a woman or a man. And I think that both women and men um, are feeling increasingly lost. Um, they are feeling increasingly confused and frustrated because they don't really know their, their role in the world. And things that are natural and instinctive to them are supposedly no longer acceptable to the point where um, a person that wants to to live within the concept of raising a family with nurturing and a loving mother and father is absolutely criticized and it, it's a frustrating situation and what really is heartbreaking to me is that children are being so damaged they're their ability to know who they're supposed to be when they grow up has gotten 
harder and harder for them to learn. There aren't that many role models in a lot of people's lives for that. Um, they're being told lies about themselves or they're being told that they should be confused. And it makes me, in terms of overall society, the future, oh my goodness, it can end up being a major mess. Oh my goodness, yes. And I just, I think we need to be realistic about this and pray about it. And um, every family that can possibly maintain these strong, good role models and the nurturing, safe home, you know, fight for it. I mean, we need to really, we need to really realize that that is by far the best way for things to be. And so uh, other than really praying and, and trying to stand for the truth, we've just got to recognize that I think we're surrounded by more sin than Corinth was. I really do. And the church needs to be willing to say this is God's standard. This is what God has intended and wanted. And we should recognize that it is going to be damaging and ultimately under a judgment for us to ignore that or to say that good is evil and evil is good. Um, God takes this very seriously and he wants good for us. Let's pray. Lord, I just pray that there'll be more and more opportunities for people to get out of the cloud of deception and confusion that the enemy has put in so many people's lives so that they can see the clarity of your goodness and what you have wanted and how good it is so that we can start shining light on the genuine that you have created. How sexuality is supposed to be, how men and women and families are supposed to be and the strength of that and the goodness and the peace. And I pray that people will have their eyes opened in your power and your light and by your spirit to see the destructive path that they're on. Just like you spoke about, Lord, in Proverbs. Help people to see the destructive path that they're taking. And Lord, I just pray that we will stand for your righteousness. And I know that more than anything, people need your salvation. How can their hearts and their minds be transformed without the power of your Holy Spirit at work in them, Lord? And I just pray that we will share the truth of salvation and of Jesus' love and of your sovereignty, Lord. If we can share it everywhere and be a light in this such dark world, be a light. So to help us make good decisions in our lives and to recognize that you will help us to make those good decisions. You want to help us to be able to obey you and serve you. Help us to know your word, Lord, and to treasure it. And God, I do pray for those who are lonely and for those who are grieving. And Lord, for those who are sick, for those who are needing a home, for those who need, a, need like provision and a job and transportation. Lord, just show them your power in their life. I know we can see your goodness in our lives, Lord. So Father, I just pray that we will love and that we will listen to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. I, I just wanted so much to really dig into this and to see what God's word says about it. We can trust him. He knows best. If you would like to join us in our church service um, on um, that streams, um, it's 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time on Sunday. Um, and you're welcome to join in. I, it will be on YouTube later. It'll be on Facebook later. Um, there is a link in the description below, and there is an orange circle with arrows on the end screen that will take you to that channel if you'd like to share with us. Or go to church and then maybe watch it later for some more worship and more word. So, all right, I love you guys. And um, if we just... All of us could just listen to what God says, the joy he has for us. I love you, and I will see you next week. Bye-bye.